We left Isabella in part one as a queen standing by her husband despite the damage he had done to their marriage with his personal relationships and the damage his wars had done to the peace and stability of England. But while Isabella had learned much over her queenship, she was about to become the saviour of England, as well as its most hated woman. By 1322, things had changed a lot for Isabella. She had gone from being a young French princess with little political influence, infuriated with her husband Edward II's infatuation with Pierce Gaveston, to a queen who was mother to the heir to the throne, a powerful politician in her own right, and a consort willing to stand by her husband through thick and thin. There had been several wars, from conflicts in Scotland to outright civil war in England, but for all the years where the couple had worked well together, Edward's latest relationship was about to tear them apart irrevocably. While Isabella had grown her relationships at court amongst the nobility, most notably with the Beaumont family, Edward had grown closer to the Dispensers, especially Hugh Dispenser the Younger. Their relationship was so close that just as with Pierce Gaveston, rumours abounded that the two men shared a bed. But just as with Pierce, there isn't really any evidence that this was the case, and although there were whispers of Edward being attracted to his male favourites even in his own time, it's equally as likely that the two men had sworn to each other as blood brothers. Today, we might call it a bromance. And where Isabella had found a way to work with Pierce, she was unable to do the same with Hugh, who resented her presence. She hated Dispenser, both for how much he was pushing himself equal to the king and because Isabella blamed him for the death of her uncle Thomas, the Earl of Lancaster. Whether or not Isabella truly cared about her uncle is uncertain, but what is certain is that his death, as a member of the nobility, set a dangerous precedent. But it wasn't just Isabella who disliked the dispensers, and they were about to make themselves even more unpopular. On the 10th of May 1322, the elder Hugh Dispenser was made Earl of Winchester, and it signalled the start of four years of tyranny. They would control Edward II from that point on to their own ends, and it was made easier by there being very little competition. When Edward had delivered swift retribution to those who stood against him, he had also removed most of the nobility that would have kept the dispensers in check. Removing these noble families and confiscating their properties had made the king very wealthy, and he bestowed many of his new properties on his supporters. However, one person didn't receive anything from Edward, his wife Isabella. She was also disgusted with his form of justice, as it extended to family members, widows and the elderly of the men who had stood against the king. Many of Isabella's friends were affected, and chroniclers also condemned the king's actions. But the reality was that it was dispenser behind much of this. He imprisoned women and children, harassed widows and extorted their money, and even kidnapped a woman for a year until she agreed to hand over £10,000. The result of this was that everyone hated the dispensers even more, and the little bit of popular opinion the king had built up faded away. The one thing the dispensers had in their favour was their ability to raise finances for the king, through fiscal reforms to the royal wardrobe and chancery, as well as creating markets within England for the wool trade so that merchants didn't need to travel abroad. The dispensers despised Isabella as much as she despised them. She had exerted considerable control over Edward for a while, and she was responsible for convincing the king to exile the dispensers 
She was the one person standing in the way of the Dispenser family's political dominance. In May 1322, Edward announced his intention to launch a fresh campaign against Scotland. By June, when the truce between Scotland and England ended, Robert Bruce began raiding in the English North once more. Edward marched to meet him with his illegitimate son Adam by his side, but just like previous campaigns, his army found no food or supplies. By October, despite the king's optimism that there was still hope for a battle, Edward's men were starving and suffering from that worst of medieval battlefield ills, dysentery. Adam died during this campaign, most likely of dysentery, and his father had to turn back to Yorkshire for men and food. Robert Bruce took the opportunity to press him, coming south and settling at Northallerton by the 12th of October. But where was Isabella? When Edward went to Scotland, he had sent his queen to Tynemouth Priory. It must have been uncomfortable for Isabella, with not too distant memories of when she had fled the same priory years before. And unfortunately for Isabella, history was about to repeat itself. By the 14th of October, Isabella was still at the priory with her ladies-in-waiting, while Edward and the dispensers were staying at Revo Abbey, a few miles east of Northallerton. Isabella felt nervous about her position, and she sent word to her husband that she wanted protection. Edward offered to send dispenser troops, but unsurprisingly, Isabella must have turned this down, as Edward changed his offer in a second letter. He instead sent Henry de Sully, a French knight, remarking that he knew this would be more agreeable than others, indicating the dispensers. When Edward received word that Robert Bruce and his Scottish army were coming towards them, he and the dispensers fled to Bridlington. In doing this, he once again abandoned his wife, very much exposed to kidnapping or attack from the advancing army. Isabella was prevented from moving south thanks to the Scottish army moving forwards, and her escape by sea was difficult because of Flemish ships loyal to Scotland patrolling the area. She also knew it would be next to impossible to withstand a siege. Isabella was instead forced to use the squires within her household, and they bravely tried to reinforce the Priory's defences before managing to commandeer a ship to escape south by sea. Fighting broke out as Isabella and her ladies-in-waiting were hurried onto the ship. Two of her ladies-in-waiting died, one from drowning while out at sea, and another after they disembarked after dodging hostile Flemish ships. This time, after landing safely at Scarborough and preparing to go to York to Edward, Isabella's fury knew no limits. It was the second time her husband had abandoned her at Tynemouth Priory and once had been too much. She realised that Edward had put both his own safety and that of Hugh above her own, and her immediate response was to blame Dispenser. And when the king's messengers arrived to meet her, they informed her that not only had Edward left Revo, but Robert Bruce had swept in and taken everything left there, and then defeated the king's forces at Byland. It snapped the limits of Isabella's patience. When Pierce Gavston had been alive, Isabella had at first been irritated by him, but later found a way to live alongside him and his relationship with Edward. No doubt she recognised Gavston for what he was, a peacock, merrily strutting alongside the king, a gatekeeper for the king's favour, but not a real political threat. He had got as far as he did because Edward allowed him. Isabella was also younger and less confident back then than she was now. But Hugh Dispenser was a different matter. He and his father were hungry for power, sharply politically minded, and it's highly likely Hugh Dispenser's interests in Edward were based more in the kingdom than in the king himself. In the ten years after Pierce's death, 
Isabella had supported Edward and been the perfect queen consort, but in late 1322, this would change. After Christmas of that year, Edward announced publicly that Isabella was to travel off on a pilgrimage in 1323 around England by herself. This was effectively the start of Isabella's separation from Edward. There isn't actually any evidence she went on pilgrimage at all, but it suggests Hugh Dispenser was whispering in the king's ear and suggesting the queen be elsewhere, now the royal couple had fallen out with one another. In mid-January until the 17th of February, Isabella went to stay in the royal apartments of the tower with her young son, Prince Edward. Things grew worse in February, when King Edward launched an attack on Louis de Beaumont, the Bishop of Durham, blaming him for the chaotic escape of Isabella from Tymouth Priory. The Beaumonts, who had long been friends of the Queen's, now fell out of favour with the King. Isabella's movements after this time go quiet until several months later, although we also know much of her privileges regarding royal patronage were revoked. This was not how a queen should be treated. Hatred against Edward and Dispenser grew amongst the general population. The Earl of Lancaster's treason had been forgotten, and all that was remembered was his public intentions of reducing royal oppression and tyranny. Miracles were reported at his tomb, as well as in St. Paul's at a tablet bearing his likeness. Edward tried to stomp this out by removing the tablet and refusing to allow people to visit the tomb. In 1323, 2,000 people were barred from leaving offerings at the tomb, and they attacked the king's guards, killing two of them. Public feeling against the weak king and his puppet master dispenser had never run so high. Sir Andrew Harclay, who had been given titles and prizes for his part in the Battle of Boroughbridge, was executed for treason. After it transpired, he had wisely tried to enact a peace treaty with the Scottish. On the 1st of August, 1323, something that had only been achieved once before happened. Roger Mortimer escaped the Tower of London. He made his way to France on a ship, continuing to Paris to seek the protection of the French king, Charles IV, Isabella's brother. He was warmly received, something which rankled with Edward back across the Channel. Charles cheerfully announced that he would, of course, expel all English exiles in France, provided Edward expelled all French exiles in England, which would have included Dispenser. While there is no evidence for it, it's possible Isabella could have recognised that the only person able to stand against the tyranny of the Dispensers was Mortimer, and she may have even recommended him to her brother. Tensions with France grew, and this would have a detrimental effect on Isabella. Edward fell out with Charles and twice postponed paying homage for Gascony. Finally sick of waiting, Charles declared Gascony forfeit in July 1324, sending an army in to take it the following month. By the end of 1324, Dispenser and Edward removed Isabella's lands cut her annual income from 10,000 marks to 1,000 marks, arrested her French attendants, and took over her household. But worse than this, Isabella's youngest children, John, Eleanor, and Joan, were removed from her under the spurious reasoning that being French, she might convince them to commit treason against their father. A common myth about Isabella is that she was not maternal, but there's no evidence for this. In fact, even though, as was practiced for the time, her eldest son went to live in his own household at the age of five, her other children remained with her, suggesting she was very actively involved in their upbringing. Equally, they would remain devoted to their mother for her entire life. Isabella was heartbroken and furious by this point, and she smuggled out letters to her brother Charles complaining about her treatment. The French king was enraged for his sister, and sent demands that Edward treat her better, which were ignored. 
On the 18th of November, Edward announced that the upkeep for the Queen's food and drink would be reduced to 2,920 marks a year, roughly a pound a day, and any French subjects remaining in France would be arrested. Despite the risks, 27 of Isabella's loyal servants and chaplains had stayed with her, and they were shut up in various religious houses across England. Isabella must have been stunned at her husband's vindictiveness. While she had expected such treatment from Dispenser, it was still shocking coming from Edward. Isabella had been a loyal and patient wife. She had given her husband four healthy children and had stood by him through stupid political decisions, failed battles with Scotland, and even his infatuation with Pierce Gavston. She had done nothing to deserve the treatment she got from her husband. As tensions grew with France and her marriage crumbled into nothing, word came that Mortimer was raising an army in Hainault. The Pope, who had suggested the marriage of Isabella and Edward in the sense of a lasting peace between France and England, suggested Isabella should be sent to smooth relations. An escape route had been opened for her. The King's envoys put pressure on Edward to let her go as well, stating that Charles had agreed that if Prince Edward was made Duke of Aquitaine and he went with his mother to pay homage, the French King would restore all lands taken from the English crown. While some later historians, especially in the Victorian period, would claim all of her actions from this point on were of a harlot queen ready to turn viciously on her rightful husband, it's clear the English queen actually had little choice. To continue as things were would have been to leave her children without a mother, herself without any dignity, and England to the dispensers. It was finally agreed, and Isabella and Prince Edward set off, arriving in Paris in March 1325. A truce with Gascony was quickly agreed upon, and the Queen's 13-year-old son paid homage for the lands England held in France to his uncle in September of that year. However, although she was supposed to go back to England at this point, Isabella refused to do so. Edward was outraged and demanded Isabella return at once, but she retorted, that she was afraid that either Dispenser would have her killed, or even that Edward himself might order it. Charles IV also replied that his sister had come of her own free will, and that if she wished to remain, she could. She was his sister, and as such, he would not expel her or Prince Edward. He also changed his mind about lands in Aquitaine, refusing to return them, resulting in a temporary arrangement where England held administration of the remaining lands under its claim, but France had the lion's share. Even if someone had agreed with Edward in regards to his wife, no one could deny he was failing politically as a ruler. It was also around this time that Isabella began to surround herself with allies. Many of these were opposed to the dispensers or had been victims of their and the king's rough treatment and they fled to Paris and flocked to the queen. It's unlikely Isabella set out for France to set up opposition to Edward, more that she hoped to threaten to leave him from a safe place until he rid himself of Hugh, but nevertheless, she was the natural choice for dissenters. She was joined by the Earl of Richmond as one of her primary supporters, Henry de Beaumont, with whom she had long been friends, and even Edward's own brother, the Earl of Kent. For Isabella herself, she publicly snubbed some of Edward's closest allies and began to dress as a widow, claiming Hugh Dispenser had destroyed her marriage. And she still had Prince Edward with her, not only was keeping him in France a good threat against King Edward, who was fond of his son, but it also allowed Isabella to potentially agree to a marriage of her son to someone who would aid her politically against her husband. Furthermore, it offered another possibility, that 
of replacing the father with the son altogether. Sometime in 1325, Isabella's cousin, Jeanne, Countess of Hainault, approached her with an offer of marriage between Prince Edward and her own daughter, Philippa of Hainault. It was a good alliance. It meant Isabella could invade England with an army not raised from France, which would win her no favours with the English, and Hainault would be a lucrative trading partner. During this, Jeanne also reintroduced the Queen to Roger Mortimer. Mortimer had been at the Hainault court raising men for an invasion of England with the full support of William I, Count of Hainault. We don't know the circumstances of their actual early meetings, but by December of 1325, Mortimer and Isabella were having a passionate affair. It was said not only that they found each other attractive, but also that they shared an interest in Arthurian legends, fine art, and expensive tastes. However, despite the strength Isabella had shown so far, this was not a partnership of equals. Reportedly, Mortimer dominated Isabella and made most of the decisions, and while this may seem odd, Isabella was possibly more than happy to have a man in a strong position looking out for her interests, even if it was probably mostly because they aligned with his. He may also have exerted a certain amount of sexual control over her, not surprising considering the loveless and sexless marriage she had been in for the past two decades. However, in public, the pair gave no indication of their private affair. It was a dangerous choice for Isabella. She lived during a time when adultery was almost the worst sin a wife could commit, and for a queen, it was treason. However, perhaps surprisingly, many of those who were her allies turned a blind eye, so long as the alliance served them well. By the summer of 1326, Roger and Isabella took Prince Edward with them and left the French court, travelling to Hainault. There, the betrothal between 13-year-old Philippa and Prince Edward took place, and using the dowry, Isabella was able to build up an army. William, the Count of Hainault, also offered up several ships as part of the marriage agreement. Isabella even got word to the Scottish King, Robert Bruce, who was all too willing to make a mutual agreement against Edward. On the 22nd of September, Isabella, Mortimer and Prince Edward set sail for England. Two days later on the 24th, their ship landed near the mouth of the River Orwell on the east coast of England. They had a small army with them, which most estimates place around 1,500 men, and Isabella quickly moved inland. While her provisions were unpacked, the Queen quickly wrote letters to the citizens of England's towns and cities, explaining she had come to avenge the death of the Earl of Lancaster and to rid the realm of the Crown's enemies, namely the Dispensers. She was met cheerfully as she travelled to Bury St Edmunds, then on to what was likely Ipswich. When her soldiers went looking for food and supplies, the local people came to her and complained that their goods had been taken. Isabella asked them what a fair price was and paid them, something which was a good bit of PR for her. Edward issued orders to sheriffs to stop Isabella when he received word on the 27th of the invasion, but they soon switched sides when it became clear how many nobles had mobilised behind the hard-done-by Queen. London became unsafe due to unrest, although most of its citizens were on Isabella's side, and Edward fled towards Wales. By the 7th of October, Isabella and Mortimer had reached the outer walls of the city of London, but by the 9th, Edward was in Gloucester. The Queen swiftly marched west in order to cut him off, but he slipped across the border to Wales before she arrived. The elder Hugh Dispenser still held Bristol against Isabella and Mortimer, but they now had a force to be reckoned with, and by the 18th of October, 
they placed the town and castle under siege. By the 26th of October, it had fallen, and Isabella was also able to be reunited with her daughters, Eleanor and Joan. She was overjoyed at seeing them once again, but the occasion wasn't all happy. Isabella had never had a huge issue with the elder dispenser, who although she knew to be politically ambitious, had shown her no animosity personally. She attempted to protect him from the raging mob, but to no avail. His Lancastrian enemies executed him, rather grimly chopping his body into pieces and feeding it to their dogs. It was a dark cloud that foreshadowed what was to come. Now in a desperate position, Edward, who was now down to a pathetic guard of 12 archers, and Hugh Dispenser the Younger, attempted to sail in a small boat to Lundy, an island in the Bristol Channel. The weather was not on their side, however, and they were pushed back to the mainland. Isabella set up her base in Hereford, and asked Henry of Lancaster, brother of the late Earl of Lancaster, to find her husband and arrest him. After two weeks of evading capture, Edward and Hugh Dispenser were finally caught near Llantrisant on the 16th of November. Revenge would be swift. Edmund Fitzalan, one of Edward's closest supporters, and Hugh Dispenser the Younger were brought before Isabella. Edmund was sentenced to execution, although this was apparently on the orders of Mortimer. He was beheaded, but some accounts suggest a blunt sword was purposely used in order to require several strokes. Hugh could expect little mercy. Knowing this, he attempted to starve himself before his trial, but with no luck. His trial was a show trial and Dispenser wasn't allowed to speak in his own defence. His gruesome execution included being hung as a thief and drawn and quartered as a traitor, as well as having his entrails removed and burned while he was still alive. On the 24th of November 1326, Dispenser was dragged out to an angry mob bent on retribution, who put a crown of nettles on his head and wrote scripture on his skin after stripping him naked. But another terrible punishment awaited the condemned man, that of castration, which can only have been a particular punishment added on by Isabella for the suspected crimes of Hugh sleeping with Edward. We know that Isabella and Mortimer were present as they watched their enemy die a horrific death, but unfortunately, we don't know what the Queen's actual thoughts were. Many myths sprang up in later years that she had eaten a meal while watching, or at least an apple. The truth is we don't know, but no doubt she was relieved at Dispenser's death. Now the only problem left was Edward. Lawfully, he was still Isabella's husband and the anointed king, and there was nothing in law that described the process to remove a monarch. But it was clear the English people would no longer put up with Edward as king. As a temporary measure, he was placed into the custody of Henry of Lancaster at Kenilworth Castle, and the king's great seal was given to the queen on the 26th of November. Once this was in her possession, Isabella began using it to create writs in Edward's name. She took the Tower of London under her control and convened a council in Wallingford to discuss what Edward's fate would be. It was decided Edward II would be legally deposed, something that had never happened before, and that his son would take the throne as Edward III. As young Edward was still not an adult, it was also decided that Isabella would be regent, but of course, as she was literally and figuratively in bed with Mortimer, he would also make the decisions. This was hardly a done deal, however, as the legal basis for deposing Edward II was shaky. There was also the delicate matter of whether Isabella, as his legal wife, should go to stay with him in his imprisonment. 
However uncomfortable a subject this may have been, it was decided that the threats Edward had previously made against Isabella's life meant it was unthinkable that she join him, especially as she also needed to be regent for her young son. These decisions were ratified at the first parliament without the king on the 7th of January 1327. A deputation of clergy was sent to persuade the king to give up his crown to his son freely, especially as Edward III refused to take the crown without his father's blessing after seeing Isabella weeping at the decision made. Isabella excused the Franciscans from sending one of their order as part of the deputation as Edward II had always been devoted to their order. This shows that, unlike the hardened woman the Queen is often painted as, she did still care about the feelings of her husband and perhaps felt pity for him, despite all that had happened. For the sake of his son, Edward capitulated the Crown of England. The reign of Edward III officially began on the 25th of January 1327 and he was crowned in Westminster a few days later on the 1st of February. The deposed King Edward II was then moved from Kenilworth to Barclay Castle in the Welsh borders, under the custody of Lord Thomas Barclay. One of Edward III's first moves was to award his mother an annual income of over 13,000 per year, rather than the 4,400 she had previously been given. While this was a huge sum of money and would later be used as evidence of Isabella's avarice, it was also about patronage. Her son's new regime was a shaky one and she would have needed to consolidate both his position and her own by giving favours and extending royal patronage. No doubt, any later greed on her part came from a desire to never again be in the difficult financial position she had been in during her early years as a bride and under the rule of the dispensers. She also purchased and was given several properties and land holdings, making her one of the wealthiest landowners in the kingdom. On the 23rd of September 1327, there came some distressing news. Edward II was dead. All they were told by the messenger was that it was due to a fatal accident. His body was buried at Gloucester Cathedral and his heart was given to Isabella in a silver casket. However, this was too neat a solution and so rumours soon began. It was known that plots to free him had sprung up and there had been three failed escape attempts by this time. It is possible that Edward died of ill health due to his treatment. While he was supposed to be looked after to the standard of his birth, and five pounds was sent every day for his upkeep, and records at the castle show luxuries bought on his behalf, many chroniclers of the time suggested he hadn't received these goods but other rumours circulated that he had been murdered. But on whose orders? The third plot to free Edward had been planned by Rhysap Griffith, a Welsh knight. Word of this got out to several of Mortimer's allies, including William de Shalford, who wrote to him to tell him of the plot. Edward II being free was a threat to Isabella's regime but it was a far bigger threat to Mortimer and his place behind the English throne. It was later claimed that Mortimer then took William de Shalford's letter to a trusted retainer, telling them to show the letter to the king's jailers and to quickly remedy the situation in order to avoid great peril. This was in early September, and in view of what came a few weeks later, can only be interpreted as orders to quietly murder the king. Roger was in Wales at this time, and Isabella was 130 miles away in London. So if this is what happened, it would appear Isabella had nothing to do with it. Later historians would point the finger of murder at the queen, but there is actually no evidence pointing to this. 
and it seems more likely that the hindsight version of her as a fallen woman committing adultery was simply embellished. In fact, despite the accusations of letters and orders, there is no evidence whatsoever of a plot to murder Edward II. A minority of historians suggest Edward may have escaped and made his way to Europe, but again, there is no evidence for this, and it seems the most unlikely outcome. The following year in 1328, on the 24th of January, Edward III married Philippa of Hainault in a lavish ceremony at York Minster. However, while it was normal for the Queen Mother to then give up her dower lands to her new daughter-in-law, this didn't happen. Isabella seems to have been reluctant to give up her position, and Philippa's coronation was postponed. The reasons for this can't be good ones. It's possible Isabella was jealous of Philippa, who was about to have a happy marriage with a youthful husband. The king Isabella was never able to have. She may have been sharing a bed with Mortimer, but as his wife was still alive, she could not marry him or publicly acknowledge him. It's also possible that after being so close to her son, as well as having such control over him as mother and regent, she was jealous of the way the new queen would influence young Edward. Scotland was still an issue. Unlike many of her contemporaries, Isabella was realistic about the war with Scotland and she knew that she had enough on her plate. A decision was made to find peace with Robert Bruce and although Edward III initially opposed it, he eventually agreed. But he bitterly declared publicly that the whole thing had been arranged by the Queen Mother and Mortimer. Peace was formally drawn up with the Treaty of Edinburgh Northampton, bringing an end to the First Scottish War of Independence. Part of the treaty was also that Isabella's daughter, Joan, would marry David Bruce, heir apparent to the Scottish throne. Edward III would renounce any English claim to Scottish lands. The Scottish would send an army against any enemy except the French and compensation would be given for the border raids to the tune of £20,000. However, those earls who had lost Scottish land holdings were not compensated, and the compensation that was given was taken by Isabella for the treasury. Overall, it was not a popular move. Many nobles became disillusioned with the new regime, including those who had once been close to the Queen, including Henry, Earl of Lancaster, and Henry de Beaumont. In order to help with public opinion, Isabella reformed royal powers of administration and local law enforcement, as well as deciding to pursue her son's claim to the French throne. While this was popular at home, it was understandably not popular with the French nobility, who threw the claims out. By the end of 1328, the country seemed ready to descend once more into civil war. Lancaster mobilised his forces and declared he was against Isabella and Mortimer. Mortimer had irritated much of the nobility by his overuse of power, especially with the fact that Roger had been created Earl of March by the young king. His ennoblement made him insufferable and haughty, and he began to act as though he was a king himself, travelling everywhere with a retinue of 180 men-at-arms and living an expensive lifestyle. In January 1328, Mortimer led an army to Lancaster's stronghold at Leicester, taking it and then marching to Bedford. Edward III rode north to force Lancaster to submit, and surprisingly, so did Isabella. As his allies deserted him, Lancaster must have realised he had little choice but to kneel before Edward and Isabella, and he did so at Bedford. He escaped death as a punishment, but was forfeit to an enormous fine, and Henry de Beaumont, fled to France. Around this time, 
Edward III seems to have started becoming restless of his mother taking over so much control of royal matters, but he especially had an issue with Mortimer. Isabella may have been greedy and overstepped the mark at times, but her son was fond of her, knew she had been through a traumatic life, and she was still a queen. Mortimer, on the other hand, was not royalty yet acted like a king, and it was also obvious that many of Isabella's decisions were at least heavily influenced by her lover. By 1330, Edward III had quietly gathered a loyal body of support from both the church and the nobles. He had also grown increasingly angry at the way his young wife was being sidelined, especially as she was now pregnant, and it was unthinkable that she should give birth without being crowned as queen. Isabella and Mortimer, under pressure from Edward, gave up some of the queen's dower lands, and arrangements were made for Philippa's coronation. Finally, on the 4th of March 1330, Philippa was crowned as Queen of England. Tensions grew, and by July, Mortimer and Isabella had placed themselves in Nottingham Castle with security, after Roger heard of plots to get rid of him. The young king had had enough, and after being summoned to a meeting with Isabella, Mortimer, and a young nobleman who supported him named William Montagu, when Mortimer declared that the king's word was in opposition to his own, it was to be ignored. Edward decided to act. On the 19th of October, Montagu was charged with leading 23 armed men into the castle by a secret tunnel. Edward knew he was watched by Mortimer's spies and so remained inside the castle, sneaking downstairs to meet with his men after retiring for the night. They burst into Isabella and Mortimer's chambers where they were having a meeting with other council members discussing the arrest of Montagu and fighting broke out. Mortimer was overwhelmed and Isabella apparently although Edward had remained outside the door and out of sight, cried out, Fair son, fair son, take pity on gentle Mortimer. She was ignored. Parliament was called the next month, and Mortimer was put on trial for treason, for behaving as a king and ignoring the Regency Council, for questioning the king's word, and worst of all, he was accused of murdering Edward II. Isabella, however, was portrayed as an innocent bystander to proceedings, and no mention was made of her affair with Roger Mortimer. This shows that Edward III, perhaps through a mixture of his fondness for his mother, his pity for all she had previously been through, and his determination to be done with the complicated mess his parents had created, wanted to preserve what was left of her reputation. Mortimer was sentenced to death and was hanged on the 29th of November 1330 at Tyburn, but Edward III showed leniency in not having him drawn and quartered. Edward wasted no time in cementing his authority, and Isabella was sent to Windsor Castle to be put under house arrest. Victorian historians would dramatically suggest she went mad, but at most, it's more likely she suffered a breakdown after the death of Mortimer. She remained at Windsor only until 1332, when she was allowed to move to her own property of Castle Rising in Norfolk. In March of 1332, Queen Philippa gave birth to a daughter, who was named Isabella after her grandmother, a conscious effort to rehabilitate Isabella at court. She remained a wealthy woman, with Edward ensuring in 1331 she was given an annual income of £3,000, which had risen to £4,000 by 1337. As per her tastes, Isabella continued to enjoy a lavish lifestyle in her middle age, employing a retinue of entertainers and singers and travelling around Europe. She also gave to religious institutions. In 1347, patronising the convent of the poor Clares. She was occasionally involved in politics, such as in 1358, 
when she was part of the peace talks with Charles II of Navarre. Her daughter Joan left her husband David II for his unfaithfulness and their loveless marriage in 1357, no doubt inspired by her mother's bravery in refusing to come home to a husband who did not care for her. She remained with Isabella, nursing her as she grew older. Isabella was very fond of her grandchildren, especially Edward the Black Prince, and she was visited frequently by her family as well as members of the court. As she came to the end of her long life, Isabella took the habit of the Third Order of St. Francis, wearing it beneath her clothes. In July of that year, she fell ill after overdosing on a medicine that had been prescribed to her for another ailment. On the 22nd of August 1358, with her daughter Joan by her side, in her early 60s, Isabella of France died. She was given a magnificent funeral by Edward III, her body buried at Greyfriars Church in Newgate, wrapped in her habit and the cloak she had worn on her wedding day. She was also buried, at her request, with the silver casket containing Edward's heart. Isabella would go down in history as possibly the most hated medieval woman, and as a queen who became a harlot, a she-wolf waiting to pounce on her lawful husband. In reality, the truth is much more complicated. She had started life as a princess groomed to be a queen, Certain all kings were like her father, who doted on his wife and ruled with a rod of iron. But when she had arrived to become England's queen, Isabella found herself playing second fiddle to a man, neglected by her husband and pushed aside at every opportunity. But she remained by her husband's side in these early years, supporting him even through his failures bearing him four healthy children and doing her duty as queen. It was only when she was pushed by his new favourite, Hugh Dispenser, her children removed and her life reduced to poverty, that Isabella decided to fight back. Not so much a she-wolf as a woman with no choice left, just as her contemporaries saw it. Victorian attitudes would have much effect on how her relationship with Roger Mortimer was seen, but through modern eyes, we can understand how a woman starved of love and affection would want a few years of happiness with a caring lover, even if the consequences were dire. She cared deeply for her children, especially her eldest son Edward III, and even in old age, Edward II never left her thoughts. In reality then, Isabella was a kind and intelligent woman, who was also greedy and had expensive tastes. A woman who was willing to put up with a loveless marriage, so long as it was a partnership, who both grew her allies and pushed them away. She was even willing to go against the constraints of her time for women, so long as it served a greater purpose for her son and her own life. In short, Isabella was an ordinary woman pushed to her limits in an extraordinary time, who changed the face of England's politics forever. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.